On this edition of Southern News Week, supermarket staff are reeling after a man goes on a stabbing rampage in Dunedin's Countdown store. New entity Business South has its first leader, who says he's up for the challenge. And Southern firefighters are heading to Auckland to take on the Sky Tower Challenge. Kia ora, good evening, I'm Melissa Barton. Countdown supermarket staff are in shock following a stabbing which left four people seriously injured. All four remain in Dunedin Hospital, three in serious condition, while the alleged attacker has been charged with four counts of attempted murder. Following Monday's devastating knife attack, about 30 staff returned to Countdown Dunedin Central today for a blessing of the premises. The blessing was done by local Kaumatua Hata Timu, and the supermarket remains closed until further notice. Southern District Commander Superintendent Paul Basham says two police officers happened to be at the supermarket on Monday at the time of the attack, and lives were saved by first aid applied at the scene. The actions of those two officers and indeed all of the people involved, the countdown staff uh, and members of the public, help to de-escalate the situation and minimise any further harm. Our first responders were on the scene very quickly and I've received feedback that indicates they provided a high standard of first aid uh, that almost certainly saved the lives of some of the victims. Dunedin Hospital's Emergency Department Clinical Director Dr Richard Stevenson says the incident affected staff on a personal level and they responded to the situation admirably. Indeed, in the hospital, whilst we train and practice to respond to this sort of event, it nonetheless uh, is a very challenging and stressful time for all staff and departments in the hospital. We're all also members of the Dean community and are shocked and saddened by this incident on a personal level. We would like to say a huge thank you to all the staff involved in yesterday's emergency response. We re received several critically unwell patients into the emergency department at very short notice, and I am proud of the job our hospital team did in caring for them. There was an excellent hospital response uh, at a hospital-wide level, uh, with teams from the emergency department, surgery, intensive care and anaesthetics providing immediate care to the patients in the emergency department uh, before moving them on to the operating theatres and the intensive care unit. All four stab victims remain in hospital, among them a countdown manager. Uh, three people remain in a serious condition, uh, but we are pleased to say that they are stable uh, and improving, with none still requiring intensive care. Uh, one patient remains in a moderate condition. The alleged offender appeared in the Dunedin District Court where his lawyer confirmed no formal mental health reports were being sought. The man, who was of no fixed abode according to court documents, faces four charges of attempted murder. He was remanded in custody until his next appearance in June. In Dunedin, the South today. A popular exhibition shown at Dunedin's Toy Toy Museum in 2016 is back after touring museums across the country. Called Slice of Life, the exhibition shows how household rooms looked in the various decades over the last half century. New Zealand International Science Festival director Dan Hendra helps empty a container load of items that was originally on display at Dunedin's Toy Tu Museum in 2016 and has now come back from touring museums around the country. Called Slice of Life, it's set to pop up as a free exhibition at the former Smith City building in South Dunedin, with individual rooms echoing the different decades of the last 50 years. Toy Tu Early Settlers Museum and uh, myself worked on an exhibition back in 2015, which was at Toy Tu in 2016. Um, and that was the seeds for this exhibition. Um, we wanted again to celebrate the study members but also sort of highlight some of the social change that's happened over the years. Uh, when our study members were born there was pretty much zero unemployment in New Zealand. By the time they reached 18 there was over 280,000 people unemployed in New Zealand. When they started there was no such thing as the internet. 
the sort of changes that have happened over their lifetime are huge. So one of the things that we did was we set up uh, rooms for each decade of the study members' lives. So 70s, 80s, 90s and 2000s. Um, and we filled those rooms with items from the right era. And in front of the rooms, there's display cases with sort of iconic images or, or items. Uh, so really, it's all about reminiscence. Um, one of the things that we realized when we finished the exhibition was that people really got a kick out of looking at their own lives and remembering their own histories. The exhibition is a tribute to all the people who have allowed themselves to be regularly monitored for the past 49 years in what is called the Dunedin Study. Uh, the team have been following a thousand babies born at Queen Mary Hospital between uh, March 1972 and April 1973. Those thousand people are now considered the most studied people in the world. Um, they've been seen at 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 18, 21, 26. 32 and 38 and most recently at age 45. Sean Hogan says that the Needham study has been groundbreaking with researchers getting insights into how external factors can affect a person's life. Our study members have impacted how we understand mental illness, um, how we treat people who get into trouble, particularly as youths. Uh, just about every area of the human condition has been explored and reported on. So the study has, has changed how life is for everybody. The Slice of Life exhibition is set to run through June and July at the former Smith City store in South Dunedin. In Dunedin, the South today. 160 years of history is set to close up shop when the Otago Chamber of Commerce ceases to exist. The Chamber and Otago Southland Employers Association have merged into Business South and the new organisation's first leader has been named. Walking into the Otago Chamber of Commerce office, the inaugural Chief Executive Officer of Business South, Mike Collins, meets his predecessor for the first time and says he's looking forward to the challenges of leading a new organisation. Yeah, look, it's pretty exciting and I've done a lot of work around bringing different cultures together um, under a kind of a similar purpose, so um, I just think this is a really great opportunity. Um, when you look at the history to the businesses, they've got a common purpose and it, and it makes good sense and I think the members have kind of sent that message as well that um, they, they see the logic behind the merger. The Chamber of Commerce was founded in Otago in 1861 and has a rich history of delivering local advocacy education and training, events, networking and more. The Otago Southland Employers Association was founded a few years later in 1890 and has provided employer advisory services, training programs, employment relations and health and safety advice. Collins admits merging the two entities could be tough at times, but says much of the groundwork has already been done. So I think having that common understanding around the why and where we're going is really, really important. There will be challenges on the way, um, but I think once we can show the value add, and there's a lot of great work already going on, so it's not actually starting from um, ground zero, there's, there's years and years of history. The previous Otago Chamber of Commerce CEO Dougal McGowan left the position with a couple of weeks notice at the start of the year. Operations Manager Nikki Aldridge-Masters was appointed to the acting CEO position to cover the time while the leader of the new organisation was found and now appointed. She wishes Mike Collins all the very best of luck with the role. And I hope what that means is for um, Mike when he does come on board that he's got a really experienced and um, solid management team that will be there to his support him in that leadership. Only having been in the top job for a short time, she was hesitant to give Collins any advice. It's going to be quite an exciting time for him, um, a challenging time, but from what I've seen and heard about Mike, he's going to lead us in a really solid way. Mike Collins says he respectfully acknowledges the history of both organisations and is looking forward to combining the depth of skills and abilities both teams bring to the merged organisation set to represent business in the South. In Dunedin, the South Today. Climbing to the top of the Sky Tower is hard enough, but one Dunedin firefighter is taking it to another level. An Otago Polytechnic lecturer and volunteer firefighter is set to test his mettle in the Man of Steel challenge. Kitting up for action. Otago Polytechnic lecturer and firefighter Brian Freeman is training to be amongst those set to climb Auckland's Sky Tower as a fundraiser. However, he's choosing to do it 
old school style. And that is carrying a steel cylinder instead of the usual. So steel cylinder is an old style thing that we don't use these days. We've got composite cylinders which are five kilograms lighter. So basically we're adding five kilograms to the, uh, to the kit that we're carrying. And it also involves climbing an extra 10 flights of stairs. Each year, firefighters from around New Zealand climb the Sky Tower in Auckland to raise money for leukaemia and blood cancer in New Zealand. The Otago Polytechnic Lecturer is one of a hundred firefighters who will be participating in the Firefighter of Steel Challenge, a longer and harder climb than usual. He's done the standard challenge before and knows what he's in for. You can imagine at the start we all take off at quite a rush, it's a general and it's going, but as you get further on you're getting hot. There are drink stations somewhere along the line and there are medical staff in case anybody has any problems, but as you just get harder and harder you just have to keep going. Freeman is due to climb 61 flights of stairs, 1400 steps in all, whereas the main Sky Tower Challenge event involves climbing 51 flights or 1103 steps carrying 25 kgs of gear. He's realistic about his expectations and is not expecting to beat the person who's won the event for the last few years. No, the record, the, oh, well I don't know for the amount of steel, I think you'd have to look up the record, but I believe it's like 8 or 10 minutes. Somebody's done it that fast in all the gears. It's, and it's the same guy, he's won it every year for the last so many years. And so yeah, I'm not sure if he's doing it this year, but he certainly he's done it every other year. For training, he's started climbing the stairs of the University of Otago's School of Business. However, he knows how he'll be at the end of the race up the stairs. By the time you get to the top, you're about finished. He's raised more than $1,000 in donations so far, before the event takes place on May 22nd. In Dunedin, the South Today. Still to come on this edition of Southern Newsweek, the Tourism Minister visits Queenstown to discuss reviving the resort, and a memorial album has been released two years after a Dunedin musician lost his battle with cancer. So catch this and more after the break. Welcome back. Following the government's announcement of a $200 million tourism support plan, the Minister for Economic Development, Stuart Nash, visited Queenstown to explain how the money will be spent. The fund aims to support the diversification of the Queenstown Lakes economy by helping to develop alternative industries and attracting private sector investment. Minister of Economic Development Stuart Nash told a Queenstown audience how the government will spend its $200 million tourism support plan over the next two years. He says half of it will go to regions where more than 50% of the local economy is based on international tourism. The region in fact that suffered the most from the lack of international tourism is actually Auckland. Um, and it's a harsh thing to hear if you're an Auckland tourism operator, but if a business folds in Auckland, uh, it's not going to bring down that local community, but also the odds of someone in a tourist business finding another job in Auckland is quite high. Whereas in places like Queenstown, Mackenzie Country, South Westland, the Glaciers, you know, when tourism fails there, when tourism is in dire trouble there, uh, that, that runs a real risk of having an immense impact on the local community. Hence the reason why uh, half the package is focused around that area. A large part of the package is called the Tourism Kickstart Fund, which will provide those businesses currently in hibernation with about two weeks pre-COVID revenue, so as to be able to reopen when tourists come back. Uh, we recognise that a lot of businesses have gone into hibernation. If you're in hibernation now, uh, the odds of you coming out of hibernation and being able to um, you know, get your business up and running in a way that uh, will be able to meet demand once this international borders open is very, very limited. Then we think you will need some support in, in the form of a grant to allow that business to scale up and, and ready to go. A further $15 million is being made available to protect Milford Sound and create a more sustainable visitor experience. Okay, Milford Sound it sort of epitomises New Zealand as we sell ourselves to the world. You know, you don't see young people dancing in nightclubs, drinking exotic cocktails. You see beautiful mountains, you see Milford Sound, you see waterfalls. We had 870,000 tourists through Milford Sound in pre-COVID times. And, you know, you talk to anyone down there, it was not the experience that we had sold to the world. And we were really running the risk of eroding the social license talk right down there. 
Other projects for the Queenstown region include a digital innovation hub and film studio. In Queenstown, the South today. Two years ago, as Dunedin musician and lawyer Malcolm Black was dying, he penned an album, Songs for the Family. The recordings from 2019 Black Made with Friends are about to be released, with proceeds going to researching the disease which claimed the songwriter's life at age 58. For today, they'll remember his smile. In 2019, songwriter and lawyer Malcolm Black returned to Dunedin following a cancer diagnosis which claimed his life in May of that year. Drummer John Hodge says it was a memorable time. Well, he's a nice, he was a nice guy. Yeah, a lovely guy. And making the album was uh, very personal. And, yeah, it was, uh, some nights was, you know, well, we all had to have a hug. In the end, but, and it was a pleasure too, because we all got to we got to play our own parts and kind of just put in what we wanted to put in to make the album. So it feels good. Guitarist Jeff Dickey says Malcolm Black asked him to put together a crew of musicians to record an album, so Black could leave it for his family. And we did re did some recording at my music room, but he. Um, we did it really roughly, and then out of the blue he goes, well, why don't we do this? He was pleased with it, but he said, why don't we do this properly? Why don't I get my friend from London to come over, Nigel Stone, who's done Peter Jackson's movies and all these other things, and we sort of looked at each other and thought, well, that's going to happen. Dickie says they'd had their doubts whether even Malcolm could get recording engineer Nigel Stone. However, Dickie says he was very pleased to be proven wrong. But... Malcolm being Malcolm, one thing he was brilliant at was just organising stuff. He didn't talk about it, he just did it. Two weeks later, this guy turns up at my place. The bandmates who joined Malcolm Black to record Songs for the Family are being joined on stage by fellow musician Steve Larkins, who says it's an honour to sing such personal songs from such a great songwriter. Very humbling because they were Malcolm's songs to his family, you know, expressing his love and the and affection for um, and the and the tragic circumstances of him being terminal and leaving so they were, it was his last kind of musical expression the album songs for the family is due to be released on may 10th with all proceeds going to the university of otago's center for translational cancer research Welcome. in dunedin the south today Former Highlander Andy Rich might be based in Wellington these days, but he's been visiting Dunedin regularly to work on his boat. The 39-foot pleasure craft is now nine months into what looks likely to become a year-long renovation project. This pleasure cruiser, built out of Cowrie in 1972 by Auckland-based boat builders Vindex, was bought in 1991 by the father of former rugby player Andy Rich. Thirty years on, the craft has become in dire need of repair. It was a 36 foot and it's been extended to a 39. Unfortunately when they did their extension it wasn't built out of cowrie and the extension basically was rotten and that's one of the reasons that we brought it around here to, to get the, uh, the rebuild done because all the extension had got freshwater damage as well as the roof. And it was at the point where it was going to sink if someone didn't put a bit of life and money back into it. The boat is currently about three quarters of the way through its renovation at Kerry's Bay Marine Services in Dunedin. We're coming up to its first birthday in here. We thought it might be finished by now, but uh, yeah, we've, we've been working on it for about nine months. Um, so yeah, look, it's not, not finished yet as you can see. So yeah, it'll be probably closer to the first birthday when it comes out of the shed. But as they say, good things take time and money. Rich has been having to regularly fly down from his home in Wellington to work on the repairs, but he's keen to not cut corners with the finishing touches on the craft not far away. 
We want to do a good paint job on it, and a good paint job just takes time. There's lots of sanding, you know, lots of bogging up, re-sanding. Um, we want a really good finish, and the yard here, you know, they take pride in their work, and um, they don't want to rush it either. They want to make a good job for us, and they've been great to work with. So, yeah, we're just uh, working nicely together. Rich says he and the boat syndicated owners are planning to use the vessel for fishing trips in Fiordland. In Dunedin, the South today. These days artists from as far away as the North Island are sending their creations to the annual art show held in Waimumu near Gore. But that's a far cry from when the exhibition was started as more or less a garage sale 11 years ago. The annual Waimumu Arts Exhibition has grown over the 11 years since Debbie Smith began the show as simply a place for local artists to show their work. In our first year we started off like slash garage sale art. We just wanted a place that artists could put their work and so that's how we started. And over the years we've evolved, listened to our feedback from our guests from our artists, from our visitors and today we're really proud to bring or showcase our work. Nowadays the exhibition sees close on a thousand people coming through the doors with artists from as far afield as Wellington sending in their works. The show also features a guest artist who this year is Awaka based artist Marie Reed Beadle who's working on a painting incorporating both cattle and native birds. What I like doing is um, interacting with all the people coming to have a look, even letting some of the children have a little paint on my um, canvas and tell them that at the end of it I'll put their name on it too, because <laughs> they did it as well. It takes volunteers about two weeks to set up the show, but Smith says the results are worth it. The highlights of the exhibition for me is seeing the response from our visitors, seeing the response from our artists. I mean, to see a red sticker on there on your work is pretty amazing. But just to, to, for them to appreciate that their work is just as good as anybody else's and, and, and the feedback. Seeing somebody walk out with a smile on their face and they've had a really positive experience when they've come through the door, it's great. The exhibition runs at the Waimumu Tetapua Hall until Wednesday afternoon. In Waimumu, the South today. Still to come on this edition of Southern Newsweek, the Highlanders coach announced he'll be looking after the team from Japan, and young Palmerston Motocross world champion Courtney Duncan continues her winning ways. So see you after the break. Thanks for staying with us. Highlanders coach Tony Brown may be 10,000 kilometres away, but he's still going to be heavily involved in the Highlanders' upcoming game plans. Brown's leaving for Japan to help coach the national side, so he won't be the head coach for the Highlanders in the upcoming Super Rugby Trans-Tasman competition. Highlanders coach Tony Brown is having to walk away from his team in order to fly to Japan to help coach that country's national team, the Brave Blossoms, also known as the Cherry Blossoms or Sakura. You know, very unfortunate, um, but also exciting at the same time uh, um, about around trying to get Japan rugby back into playing test rugby, so um, having played for over, well over a year, almost two years now, so um, playing the Lions in, in Scotland is a huge challenge for Japan rugby. Um, but unfortunately, I have to leave early around um, my job here with the Islanders. Brown has been assistant coach for Japan's national team for about four years and says he's been fortunate to be able to coach for both teams, in part due to the seasonal nature of the sport. I'm pretty lucky as a rugby coach, Japan let me coach the Highlanders and the Highlanders let me coach Japan um, and sometimes it's going to overlap. Despite heading off to help Japan with two weeks quarantine ahead of him, he'll still be involved with planning team strategies for the Highlanders, while assistant coach Clark Dermody deals with the team face to face. Um, obviously you'll still have a major role in planning for each game, um, making sure our plans are right on the money around trying to win games of rugby. Um, and also reviewing games, making sure the players are getting the right feedback and the team's moving in the right direction. Um, and then 
obviously Durham's is going to be the man on the ground here and drive the team from day to day. On the same flight to Japan this week will be the Brave Blossoms head coach, Jamie Joseph, with both men working on getting the team ready for their match against the Lions in Edinburgh at the end of June. In Dunedin, the South today. Off-road riders battled Mutt and the two times Women's World Motocross champion in Cromwell over the weekend. While Courtney Duncan looks set to win the event just like last year, a spill in her second race saw the Palmerston rider having to battle her way back from last. A heavy shower of early morning rain didn't stop riders from giving their all on the muddy central Otago motorcycle track near Cromwell on Sunday. More than 200 motocross riders took part in the event, knowing that only one could take home the crown of King of Central MX. However, just like last year, the presence of two times women's world motocross champion Courtney Duncan meant that the winner was a queen rather than a king. Duncan won the first MX2 race against 25 men by five seconds, but then she came a cropper at the start of the next race, having to come back from dead last to narrowly miss out on the second race by just one second. The third race against the men saw the plucky rider from Palmerston win by 38 seconds. And then there were also three women's races, with Courtney Duncan winning each several minutes ahead of her nearest rival. It was Duncan's first race in several months, and she says it was good practice leading up to her sixth time competing at the World Motocross Championships in Europe in July. In Cromwell, the South today. A stationary fundraiser in Oamaru has raised around $3,000 while participants pedalled furiously. The spinathon involved a group of people cycling as fast as they could for charity while going nowhere. They might have looked like they were getting nowhere, but almost a dozen teams on exercycles pedalled hard to reach their goal of raising $3,000 in North Otago Plunkett's major fundraiser. Called a Spinathon, the charity event at the Waitaki Community Recreation Centre had bikes on loan from two Oamaru businesses for anybody to ride throughout the day. Organisers say they're very pleased with the event, with a number of people dropping in throughout the day to help raise funds for Plunkett. All the money raised was earmarked to stay within North Otago. In Oamaru, the South today. That wraps up this edition of Southern Newsweek. For the latest news from the Southern region, head online to odt.co.nz and follow Channel 39 on YouTube and Facebook. Ka kite anō. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.